He's one of the um, most influential uh, logotherapists in the world. He's very well known for his work in therapy, philosoph philosophy, and research in the field of logotherapy. He's one of the main contributors to uh, the fact that logotherapy is so well known and it's very well spread in the world today. And I want to really personally thank you for the work that you're doing. We are standing on the shoulders of giants and you're one of these giants. Uh, yeah, you are. <laughs> I can keep going. Uh, so thank you for coming here and really I think this is part of the big tent that we're speaking about meaning is also to see meaning through different perspectives and I think logotherapy is a very major one. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kenny. Okay, with this introduction I'm going to fail anyway. Um, question, can you hear me well in the last row? Is it okay like this? Fine, good. Uh, if I start, English is not my first language, so if I start to use strange words or if you think I'm talking too fast, just interrupt. We have a small group, just raise your hand and say, please slow down or make clear what you want to say, and so on. Um, we've got only a very little time, so thank you. Um, and I'm going to give you a brief introduction in the work we are doing in Vienna and in Moscow. Uh, I've got a professorship in Liechtenstein as well, as you see here. Uh, just to add another aspect, much of what I'm doing uh, owes itself to logotherapy. Uh, another large branch of my research is the psychology of death and dying, and both converge to a very large extent. So um, both these topics we are going, I'm going to present today, not really talking about death and dying, but the implications and also what, death and, what dying people are telling us in hospice work, for example. Um, good. Now, let's begin. If you look, most of you know this, psychology is a fairly new discipline on the scientific landscape, and yet um, it is as old as humanity. If you look at early literature, theology, you know, holy scriptures, and so on, you find um, a often recurring question which comes along so very simple and is so yet, and yet so difficult to answer what finally will make us happy yeah um, and there are hundreds if not thousands of studies working in one way or the other approaching the question when finally or when will you the individual person find happiness and fulfillment yeah there are many different answers in recent years, since 2000, when positive psychology came along, uh, psychologists started really to look into not only what makes people fail, but also what makes them strive, where to find happiness. The science of happiness somewhere here. Um, uh, yeah, the science of happiness, the how of happiness, and so on and so forth. And while there's much value in these things, um, I would like to offer another perspective, and this is I'm not going to talk about Frankl very much, but I just wanted to sh um, show you one thing. The most important thing, I'm very interested in the history of ideas, is when which idea was born. If you look, um, I don't know how many of you know Viktor Frankl in his life, when he was a young student. <laughs> <laughs> Not as a young student. Uh, when he was a student, he was listening to Paul Federn, the famous analyst in Vienna. Um, he was corresponding with Sigmund Freud, and he, he considered himself to be a student of Sigmund Freud, even though he was, I think, 18 or 19 years old. And then of Alfred Adler, whom he also knew personally very well. But if you look at when these people died, yeah, um, these great Viennese psych psychiatrists, yeah, uh, Freud died in 39 here in, in London. Some of you might know the Freud Museum. Uh, Adler died in 38, briefly before the Anschluss, briefly before Austria became part of the huge Nazi empire. Uh, Frankl, on the other hand, um, died much later, and he, being Jewish, yeah, also went, like millions, went uh, through the concentration camps. He was in Theresienstadt, in Dachau, in Auschwitz, very briefly in Auschwitz, but he was in the camps. So his approach to the question what makes us happy or what is a good psychology was of course a bit different because after 45, 46, there were two major events in human history. It was Auschwitz in the camps and it was Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And suddenly, I mean, at the latest 
point, at this point, yeah, humanity lost its innocence because we saw what man can do, and we can we saw only mentally, intentionally, yeah, and also what is at stake if you look at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah, so. Um, Having this just as a background information, yeah. When it comes to the question and quest for happiness, there's something which is um, which is always coming across us. What about the earnest and serious issues of everyday life? If you walk through London, for example, the most beautiful areas, the best shops, and so on, but. Do you see how many homeless people are lying in the corners? Yeah, um, and how do you afford, I mean, mentally afford your happiness when you see the suffering all around? Yeah, and not only the suffering of others, but your own as well. Because uh, let's face it, it's wonderful to be happy, and if happiness comes, celebrate it, enjoy it. Yeah, but it is, don't take it for granted because then you lose gratitude, which is a great human ability. Yeah. Um, so what about pain, what about suffering, what about guilt, for example, and finally, what about compassion? If you, if you take the happiness thesis too seriously, yeah, you might lose sight of the enormous strength of humans, namely to feel with other humans, like compassion. Compassion means basically that you make the suffering of somebody else your own because you somehow want to help, you want to engage, yeah? you don't want to look away. Yeah? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah? Okay. By the way, is my tempo fine? Yeah, is it okay? Can you follow? Good. Uh, the second point is, and this I learned in Japan when I was talking about happiness and I was taught something better, yeah? um, the very strong preoccupation with um, well-being and happiness, uh, we think this must be or could be a universal trait of humans. It is not. If you are in Japan and you talk about happiness, for example, people will tell you, well, it's okay to feel good and have no problems, yeah, but it's not so good if you are very well off and your neighbor isn't. It doesn't feel right. Yeah? And this is really ingrained in their culture. It's not something they learn because they read a book on compassion. It's really something in the mindset, in the tradition of other cultures. I'm also in Zimbabwe, in, in, in Africa from time to time, and that's the same. Yeah? If you have a small village and um, let's say in one hut somebody has, you know, father lost his child, yeah, um, it's not okay to be overly happy because it would be lacking a very basic human uh, capacity, empathy, yeah, being concerned not only with oneself but with the with the world because we are part of it, no. And the last point, and this one I would like to delve upon because it leads us directly into meaning, yeah. Um, even if happiness was such, or well-being was such a great motivation, it just doesn't work as it should work. Yeah? Why? Because if it was so easy that you just intended happiness, uh, uh, or love, whatever is good, laughter, self-esteem, yeah? if you just intended it yeah, and you got it, it would be so easy, and we psychotherapists would be so unnecessary, unnecessary because you know you just tell somebody, well, try to be happy. Yeah. Now, what happens when people try to be happy? They become very tense because they feel obliged to be happy. Yeah. And if you look, for example, and everybody knows this, at a congress when you take a group picture and the photographer tells you, please smile. Yeah. Look at these smiles. If he told a joke, something which is funny smile would come, you know, on, on, on wings, no, without intention, yeah. Um, and there's, there are many lessons in, in recent history in psychology. For example, I, I was always astonished by the book title, yeah, You Must Relax. Now try to, re try to even relax in your mindset, yeah, when you hear the command, you have to relax, yeah, you feel the tense, you feel the fist, no, uh, it's not, but if, if the title was, it doesn't care whether you relax or not, relaxation would come immediately, you know. So sometimes if we over-intend certain things, yeah, it does no good, you get the opposite of what you want, yeah. Um, and we also tried, uh, in Vienna, we wanted to test something, um, because speaking of intention, there is a school of thought, not so much of thought, but, but a, a idea in pop psychology, namely positive thinking. And everyone knows that if you want to get hired or if you want to be a good lecturer or whatever, yeah, it's good to have some uh, self-esteem, to be assertive. 
And if you go to a bookstore here at Falls, or everywhere, all around the world, yeah, you'll see books like How to Be Assertive. And one of the first exercises you're going to read is give yourself a pep talk to tell you I'm good, I take room, I'm, I'm charismatic, I'm magnetic, and so on. G tell yourself that you are good, yeah? Hyper intent, to, you know, intent, yeah? Now, you read this over and over and over again. So finally, a student of mine and me, we thought, well, if you read it so often, has it ever been put to a test? And the answer is no, not really, yeah? Until we did a study too by now in Vienna. What we did, we had, um, there's a self-esteem scale, which is quite reliable. And we had um, a group of students split into two, yeah? One group was giving, given a small article from a management magazine on how to give yourself a pep talk and positive thinking, I'm good, I'm great, and so on. And the other group yeah, only read a book on how the birds navigate in winter when they flee uh, the coldness. And they should ponder and think about it. So a very neutral control group and the pep talk, positive thinking group. Yeah? And then we did the self-esteem scale uh, two times within 30 minutes. At the beginning, of course, self-esteem was no different between control group and positive thinking group. It doesn't make sense, no? because that means we had a good randomization. After 15 minutes, when the positive thinking group gave itself a pep talk on how great they are, how wonderful, how you know, dynamic and so on they are, yeah, their self-esteem raised very, very high. Yeah? As high as you see sometimes in hypomanic patients. So, yeah? Okay, but that's fine. That, that's what it was intended for, no? The main point was that after about 30 minutes, their self-esteem declined enormously, far, far, far below what it was before. Yeah? And here what you have is like when you have mild depressive sym symptoms, people lose self-esteem. Yeah? And after 30 minutes, they are very, very low. Now, in the follow-up study, because when you observe this, you think that's interesting, so first question, does it work? The answer is only very briefly and then no longer. The second question is, why this phenomenon? And the answer comes by thought protocols. You know the, the, the technique in, in measurement? Okay. Most of these subjects felt extremely well about themselves. But after a while, your, your rationality, or however you call it, sets in, and they wonder, I feel really great, but how does this compare to reality? And then the hiatus, I say hiatus, you know, then the difference between what is and what you believe is becomes very, very visible. And the more visible it becomes, the lower your self-esteem, because you see the many areas in which you still could do better and still could improve, yeah? And then suddenly you have a very low rate, yeah? By the way, this speaks also about positive illusions and the role in depression. We know from the, that most depressive, well, at least mildly depressive patients do have a much, much more unbiased view on their own reality, yeah? Whatever you take. But anyway, that's, that's um, the, the problem of hyperintention. Will you tell me when I'm... Yeah? We don't want to make the half time because then I know how to proportion things. Thank you. Good. Now, if you look at uh, what Frankl said, keep this in mind also, yeah, please, if you want. Um, if you look at what Frankl uh, wrote in the 1940s, 50s, again, relatively fresh from the camps and, and already working as a psychiatrist in Vienna, um, he said, by observation, there seem to be three main issues, main hallmarks of what constitutes a neurotic worldview. Yeah? The first one is enforced pleasure seeking, what I call hyperintention. Yeah? Trying to get it directly with the outcome that you're only tense but not very happy. Um, and so by definition also avoiding everything which could be unpleasant. Anxiety is, is a very ripe fruit of this. Um, Second, dependence should be dependence on feedback, on what others are saying, um, but also dependence on inner feelings and circumstances. In other words, being at the mercy of, of others in one way or the other. How others react to you, whether they smile at you, whether, you know, you know <laughs> you're know, neurotic patients anyway. And third comes a bit closely related to this, to this avoidance of responsibility. Yeah? You observe this over and over again. Um, with neurotic patients. Now, 
Speaking about avoidance of responsibility and the unpleasant, I would like to offer a brief anecdote because I think it's very telling. I'm teaching also at Vienna Medical School. And next to our lecture hall, there's the neuro-oncology department for children. Yeah, children with brain cancer. And one of my students, for almost the whole term, always came 30 minutes late. And usually I don't really mind if people, students come late, but in this case, if it comes up repeatedly, I one day asked her, you know, don't you think you can take an earlier bus, come earlier to us, no? And she said, yes, sorry, but I'm, I, and then she told a story. At the beginning of the term, a good friend of her was doing an internship as a nurse at the neuro-oncology department next door, next floor actually. Yeah? And when this friend came and saw how the nurses are really worn out and burned out by their work, yeah, um, she offered spontaneously offered to make the coffee for them. Because if you are a nurse in the oncology department, you not only take care of the children, but also of the parents and the grandparents. And every minute which you spare not at the coffee machine or doing paperwork is a needed minute because it helps people that you are there, you understand. Very often the nurses and the doctors, are, but the nurses especially, are the only ones who understand. The outside world can't imagine what it is like. No? And when she saw that her making the coffee um, did help, indirectly a lot of people, no? she continued doing so almost every week because she said, I'm going to the lecture by Batiani anyway, yeah? so a little earlier I come into the coffee and then the friend came and another friend came and said, you know what, if you're here already waiting for the coffee to, to, to run through, could you do some paperwork? And she started to volunteer. And then she said, you know what, I've got two hands um, and limited time. If any one of you would like to join Whatever you do, you don't need to have contact with the patients themselves, but you can help so that the patients are helped and the parents and so on. Yeah? No. So, so she said, would you, who would ever, who would, whoever would like to come, please come. And there were two basic reactions from the, in, in the audience. Number one was saying um, how very awful you know, this, the, what fate can do. Yeah? Of course, I will volunteer. Not every day, but from time to time. And the other group was saying, how very awful, I would never be able to bear this, I won't help. Now, avoiding the unpleasant in this case means it doesn't go away if you don't look. You're only protecting your own well-being. And don't ask me, because I don't know, yeah, but think for yourself, how much well-being do you have in the same evening when you're in your bed and you think about the day which has just passed, and you saw there was an opportunity to do very little, like cook, like making coffee or some paperwork. Yeah? Um, and how, how do you feel? And I don't think that, the, that happiness is the, is the outcome of fleeing the unpleasant. Because sometimes life is unpleasant. Yeah? And sometimes we are just needed. And it doesn't, nobody asked you know, existence, nobody asked how do you feel. It's just because now you have heard a question what do you do with it? Will you say no and slam the door in the face of existence? Or will you say, yes, OK, a little bit I can do? You know? um, good. There's an interesting phrase by Frankl, um, which, uh, which I found and which I find very fitting to this in this case, yeah? basically saying someone, a man or a woman, who tries to anesthetize himself so it's no problem, eliminates no misfortune. What he does eliminate is really the consequence of the misfortune, the feeling of unhappiness. But you see the difference between what is and how you react, no? Um, but just as we cannot create something by looking at it, we cannot destroy it by looking away. I wish it was so easy, but it is not, yeah? Um, so, do you still follow me and get what I'm saying, yeah? Good. I would like to offer an insight which is basically not mine, but the insight of millions of people who are doing some valuable work in life yeah, um, and are therefore are open for existence. Yeah. Um, namely that it's not so much about happiness, but there are no shortcuts to fulfillment. It's not that you just strive for being happy and that you get what you want. Yeah? If you do it over and over again, you come out in a very deformed way because you lost your your compassion, your empathy, what we are here for. Yeah? Good. Yeah? Ah, already. Wow. Ah, okay. 
I try to hurry up anyway. Um, if you, I would like to introduce someone, maybe some of you know, Max Scheler with cigarettes. Um, and Max Scheler is, I believe, one of the founding fathers, unrecognized founding fathers of existential psychology and psychiatry and psychotherapy. And he wrote this little, little booklet. I don't know whether it's available in English. Those of you who read German, write, it's very small. It's about 120, 120 pages. And in it, he makes a very valuable distinction between feelings as such and feelings with a reason or for a reason, yeah? or put it differently, object related whether subject centered. And to give you an idea why this leads us and why this involves meaning and, and to a very strong extent. Now, take grief and depression. For, for looking from the outside, they look very similar. Yeah? Somebody who is in bereavement, doesn't move too much, isn't overly motivated, feels a little hopeless, and so on. The same goes for someone who's suffering from depression or and whatever kind it is, yeah, or just has a very bad day, yeah. But the difference is enormous, and it's also it shows itself in treatment. If you are just having a bad day or a mild depression, you could easily take a tranquilizer, benzodiazepine, and all the unhappiness would lift, would be lifted, and you'll have a certain level of, let's say, relaxed joyfulness, yeah. If you are grieving, and we know this from studies, and you take tranquilizers, nothing goes away. Why? Because you're grieving for a reason. It's another language of love. Love turns now into I'm missing someone. Yeah? No medication in this world, unless it really knocks you out, can take this knowledge away from you. The whispering voice telling, I am missing this or that person, which is, you know, which has been a gift in my life and has been taken away. Yeah? Um, very similar. Uh, goes for hate and aggression. Now, aggression, if you're aggressive, and sometimes it happens, you know, too much sugar, whatever it is, yeah, there are millions of ways, or hundreds of ways, to cope with, with aggression. You can go into the forest and shout, you can listen to very loud music, you can drive recklessly in a car, slam a door, uh, you know, um, uh, push a cushion, whatever, yeah, and then it's done. It's like steam escaping, it's escaped, um, story finished. What about hate? What about, for example, the hate somebody feels for a government which oppresses its people, takes away the liberty of, of expression and opinion and so on? Yeah? Um, it also feels like aggression, but no problem would be solved if you shouted in the, in the forest or if you slammed the door, because something in us speaks to us, which tells us, I am meant, I have to involve myself. You see what I'm saying? Yeah? Uh, so therefore, this seems to be to me, a very good distinction, um, and I would like to give you an even stronger point of this. Yeah, I happen to collect psycholo psychology newspapers and journals from the uh, between the wars, 1920 to 1930 to 40. It's an enormously, believe it or not, enormously interesting topic because you see many of the life reform movements, you see many of the things um, unfolding, and so on. And one day, I found a. Uh, a uh, journal called Lichtbote, which means bearer of light, something like that, yeah? And the title was Finding Rest in Restless Times. How is that possible? Now, and the magazine, the design was a bit different. Looked almost like a twin brother of what you see nowadays when you go to W.H. Smith and you see these pop psychology and esoteric magazines, yeah? But there was a difference, yeah? This was published in Berlin in 1940, yeah? Um, and that was the time when millions, no, yeah, well, in Berlin, hundreds of thousands of Jewish neighbors disappeared overnight. Yeah? And many of the people who read these, uh, these newspapers and journals back then were middle class people in Charlottenburg and so on. Yeah? In the very same corners and quarters of Berlin where the neighbor was away overnight. And the next day, the Gestapo came and took the furniture, the piano, the, the jewelry, and so on. Yeah? So, question. Uh, finding rest in restless times, do you even want this? Yeah? The question, how is it possible, becomes, becomes a new dimension. Yeah? How could you ask? No? So, this is, why we are, this is why meaning, why what we are here for, what we are responsible, what we are good for, is such a central question. Needs to be much more introduced I'm preaching, preaching to the choir, I know, but, but needs to be much more introduced into, into even pop psychology, you know? Good. Um, 
we find the same, but time is running a little bit. But anyway, we, if you are interested in the history of ideas, in the 1960s, um, in the wake of the Vietnam War, yeah, um, there was a very similar movement. Whenever it shouldn't be there, this movement was there. Yeah? Um, and Steve Kent from Illinois University wrote a beautiful book uh, called From Slogans to Mantras. And what does From Slogans to Mantras mean? Look, this picture is a very dark picture. It shows um, um, Vietnamese women, mothers actually, and their children taking shelter from the napalm bombers. You know, napalm is a phosphor. If it touches your skin, it burns. You're basically alive. Yeah? Now, you see the fear. And once these pictures came to the States, the, the obvious reaction was at least go on the streets and shout, stop it. Now, not with us. Yeah? Um, but a few years later, um, in the wake of the so-called psychedelic revolution, yeah, people moved inwards, and they from slogans to mantras. And uh, inwards meant before we can solve the war in the outside world, we have to solve the war in the inside world. And you can be very busy solving the war in the inside world. Yeah, um, and this is how it then looked like: people screaming. You know, this is dynamic meditation by Bob Manfred Rashid. There was a guru, and so it doesn't matter what it is. But screaming, being desperate, but not about what is happening in Vietnam, but it was what, what they think is happening inside of them. Yeah? Hyper intention for happiness blinds you for what is happening in the world. But you are in the world. We are in the world, no? Good. Um, okay, I. This is a beautiful quote, and it's far too long for a PowerPoint presentation, and it's far too long given that we don't have too much time. Uh, only to tell you, uh, philosophers, much more than psychologists, yeah, sometimes ask the psychologist, what do you do with this? Yeah? Briefly, why would anyone care to rescue the la last tigers in Russia yeah, when you would never see them? What makes us do this? Yeah? Why would an artist yeah, sacrifice his biological life force for paintings, yeah, painting day and night, knowing very well that nobody will ever see them or very few people will see them? Yeah? And second, uh, last question is, uh, what kind of interest makes a person want to know a distressing truth, something devastating, yeah, on the deathbed, even though he knows fully well that he can't do anything about it? still we want. What is it? Yeah? And the, the answer to this is somehow there's something in us, which I call, for, for lack of a better word, um, our existential sense, our understanding, it, at least implicitly, even if the hedonistic uh, side guys teach, preach something very different, somehow we know yeah, that this is our existential I don't know, center, core, whatever you call it. Yeah? Good. Um, Okay, so much to this. Second hallmark of the neurotic, or let's say, of the neurotic worldview, because it affects many more than neurotics, is a dependence, once again, with the, uh, on feedback and feelings and circumstances. Now, there's a very simple um, question in psychology. If you ask yourself, or if your patients, or if anyone around you, what makes me feel good, you get the whole huge wellness industry, you get the idea that it's, you know, life owes it to you that, that you are, no <laughs> uh, that you feel good and so on. And basically what it means is it depends on what you get, yeah? Whatever you think is motivation theory. It might be libido, it might be power. Some of, some of us are born in, in families where there's more power, some of us in a beautiful body, so they might have more sex, whatever, yeah? But it depends on circumstances which are beyond your control. And therefore, your happiness depends on circumstances which are beyond your control. Even biologically speaking, yeah? take sugar, for example. If you eat one ice bar and you have so many grams, you feel slightly elated. Take the double dose and suddenly you, it plumps down and you're not very well. And you don't even know why. Yeah? So it, you are very dependent on your circumstances. But if you're asking, what am I good for? Where am I needed? What could I do? What could I, where could I share, for example? Yeah? Um, then it doesn't depend on what you get, it depends on what you give, in other words, what you do. Yeah? It gives you much more authority over life. Yeah? So even if happiness and meaning wasn't your main goal, but freedom was, yeah, this would be good advice. Don't look at what you get, look at what you can do, yeah? what you're good for. 
Yeah. So, and very simple. Everybody knows this from psychology class 101. Yeah. Um, there is a huge, there is a strong correlation, but not a must be between what we receive and what we send out. So if you go to a shop and the shop assistant smiles at you and is very kind, it's very, very easy to be kind. Yeah? If he or she isn't, it's also very easy to be unkind. No, it just happens. No? But, um, and in more complex lives, people will tell you I had a very bad childhood. How could you expect me to be loving, caring, and empathetic to other people? Yeah? People ask this. Yeah? And then, you have to show them something which is true about us. It is true that we are largely dependent on others, and yet we are not fully dependent. We are free to a certain extent. And if you allow me yet another anecdote, but it, to me it was the moment of revelation when I was a student in psychotherapy. We were in Munich, and we had a therapy course, and we had, over four years we went there every second weekend, and one day, one of our co-students, who was a bit older, 45 or so, um, got a prize, an award from the city of Munich for opening up a home for children from broken homes. And because his concert was so brilliant and these people, these children flourished and they were really doing well, yeah, he received this prize or award. And my therapy teacher um, told him, well, would you like to tell us what you know, what do you do? Why, do? why do you do it? And all of us, I think really all of us, by the looks of him, expected he, that he would tell us, you know, I had such a wonderful childhood, I thought I must share yeah, what I received. But what he told us was very different. His father was a very aggressive alcoholic. His mother was bipolar, but not under medication, or very halfway under alcohol, but not really medication. And he was the youngest of three brothers. And all the anxiety, frustration, hate, yeah, ended in a dead alley, it was him. And he, exp he describes how every night when he was um, falling asleep, he looked back in anxiety and horror to the day which was, which was closing and in horror anticipating the day which was coming. Yeah? So this he told us. And then he made a break and said, put this aside, I would like to tell something else. Um, many studies show, this is still a student speaking, yeah? um, Many studies show uh, something which is called intergenerational abuse. In other words, and we do, not, we do know that this is true because it's been replicated also in different cultures, if children are suffering from abuse in the sense of being not loved, being hit, being discouraged and so on, yeah, five, well, um, then they tend to give, when, when they are parents themselves, they tend to do the same to their own children. And he, he, this he told us, okay? And then back to biography. And then he said, uh, thanks to his grandfather, who at least encouraged two of the boys to go to school, to, to finish school, yeah, at least, yeah. Um, he was, um, a few years ago, um, uh, inscribed to study engineering. And one day, he went to a supermarket to buy some cigarettes, and he saw the newspapers. And one of them was Psychology Today, and the headline was How Children of Broken Homes Fare in Life. Yeah? And he thought, well, that's something re which relates to me. Picked up the magazine, yeah? sat down in front of the supermarket, smoked a cigarette, and read the, um, the article. And the article was exactly about the finding I just told you about the danger of passing it on yeah? by, model by role model learning, whatever it was. Yeah? And he read this. And he did have a girlfriend, but no children and no grandchildren, let alone. Yeah? But he read this and said, well, what does that mean? Could this mean that I pass it on to my children and to my children's children? Yeah? And this chain, he told himself, yeah, it has to stop. And it has to stop with me. There he went, therefore, he went to the university uh, got, uh, and exmatriculated for engineering. Study, started studying psychology in the shortest time possible, wrote a brilliant PhD uh, thesis on uh, helping children from broken homes, observed a few courses which you need to do, and then luck had it that, his, um, um, that the children's home was closing down outside of Munich, and his professor, seeing this brilliant young man being so motivated, somehow succeeded in getting funding so it could be reopened. 
with his concept he developed for children from broken homes. And he said, you know, um, very, yeah, he said, you know, until on the very first day I received the keys to this home, yeah, the intrusions, you know, the, the memories of being hit in the, in the alcoholic phase of my father and my mother being up and down, up and down, it ceased, it stopped. It was my first peaceful night when I, when I had the keys. Yeah? And then very modestly and humbly he added, and you know what, um, all of you have to study what people from broken homes need. I don't need to study, I know from biography. Yeah? So, speaking about what we receive and what we send out, yeah? um, this boy, this man didn't receive much happiness as a child. But he chose to send out something very different. Yeah? Not being determined by his past. Or if determined, he could at least choose in which way it would determine him. Now, if you look um, at the outcome of this, why the positive is worthwhile pursuing, the meaningful is worthwhile pursuing, it did good to, let's say, hundreds of children, and their children, and their children's children, children's children, yeah? Uh, it did good to him because he could close down the chapter. It was a memory, he didn't want to forget it, it was there, but at least it didn't take much more of a toll than that which is absolutely necessary, his memories. Yeah? And in a very crooked, a very, very almost magic existential way, it even changed something about the past. Why? His parents, if everything would have gone as the textbook predicts, would have become guilty indirectly for the suffering of his own children and their children. But he somehow could take this out of their balance by himself changing. Yeah? So you see the magic ingredients of meaning, it really makes a difference. Yeah? It makes a difference in all ways, so to speak. Yeah? Good. Um, I need to sum everything up. Okay, you know what? I'm going to tell you a little two-minute thing. Yeah? Number one, um, speaking of this, here is text. <laughs> um, if we talk about um, uh, very often patients, maybe we also think that we can only give as much as we received before that. Yeah? And I would just like to point out, uh, since earliest time, people were looking for the perpetuum mobile, for something which generates energy rather than merely changing it. Yeah? Um, it's not possible physically, but, and I know this sounds very kitschy, but it's still true. Yeah? Love and care and compassion makes exactly that difference. It's not that if you love one person, suddenly your reservoir of love is there minus one person you already love. Yeah? Or if you give compassion to one person, it's not that you can no longer find kind words for another person. On the contrary, it builds up. Yeah? Once you open the channel of your heart, it flows enormously. Yeah? And you go out of the clinic and you see the birds and you see nature and suddenly you see, this is sharing. This is I, what I believe and hope I can convey what we are meant for. What we, yeah? um, so the perpetuum mobile, physically impossible, psychologically definitely possible and very something which would be good for us and for the world. Yeah? And last not least, yes. And last but not least, um, very often when students listen to me or listen to, yeah, um, they say, how can you talk about meaning if the world is so broken and there's so much suffering, yeah? And I can only reply to this, yeah? Um, there's something very unique about humans. We bring something into this world which isn't there without us, hope. <laughs> hope means that you see something is not perfect and you somehow hope that you can change it, heal it, make it for the better. Yeah? If we give up hope, hope will disappear from the face of the earth. Yeah? So we are not only talking about meaning in the sense of it's good for you, for humanity and psychology, it's very good for the world as such, because without us, there would be no such thing. Thank you very much.